Hallelujah. Let us pray. To you that hear prayers, all flesh come. Lord, our hearts are so overwhelmed with gratitude tonight. It's, it's still like a dream, but I want to say thank you. You hear prayers. The Bible says you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And you are doing just that. Thank you. Thank you for your hand in this place. Thank you for your spirit that resides here. Thank you for the canopy of grace, and the palpable presence that you have chosen to bestow upon this place. And Lord, we stand on the platform of your mercies that is so lavish here tonight to ask that you will show us the way. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Give us right lenses, eyes that can see, ears that can hear, a heart, a heart that is fixed by your mercies, a heart that is quickened to understand. Help us, Jesus. Guide my heart and choose my words for the praise and honor of your great name. For thine alone is a kingdom the power and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name and God's people say, Amen. Hallelujah. All right, as we go along, we'll find a proper title of some sort for what I'm trying to do. My goal, however, is to do a kind of a survey of the import of the apostolicity that we attribute to our labors and to our posture in the spirit. When you talk about an apostolic center, the word apostle, apostleship, apostolic is a word that is um, used very frequently, especially in this kind of cycle, but it's important for us to have a biblical notion, a conception that is faithful to scripture of what we mean by that kind of designation. Uh, chiefly because this is an apostolic labor. And if it be an apostolic labor in DNA, we need to have a conception of the apostolicity by which we brand this as an apostolic label. Um, apostolic is not just a fancy word that we throw around. It's not something that we use just to give clout to what it is that we do. It's not just a way to distinguish what we do from what other people do. And the apostleship is not, uh, is not, is not the way that God rewards. I was saying this somewhere, I can't remember. But the apostleship is not how God rewards visibility. All right? It's, there's a DNA, there's something in the spirit that is bound up in that designation. And I feel that because of the season that we are in, it's important for us to redig the wells of understanding so as to have a proper introduction or induction or initiation afresh into the spirit of the kind of language that we use as an apostolic people. It's very possible for somebody to have something and be ignorant of and in that which they do have. God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So um, you can be called a people and you may not even know the import of what it is that you are called. You can be something and you may not know uh, how to explicate because you yourself do not properly comprehend the implication of what you are. It's like that day when Jesus was talking to his um, disciples when they said, should we call down fire just like Elijah did? And Jesus said to them, you know not what spirit you are of, all right? He's saying to them, you are something that you don't really understand. Do you get it? 
he, he wasn't trying to tell them what to be. He was trying to say to them, what you are, you don't seem to know it. Are you there? What you are, you do not seem to understand it. And so he gives them perspective into the implication of what it is that they were. He wasn't trying to make them something on that occasion. He was simply trying to draw out the practical implication of what it is that they were. And that understanding will affect and impact on the practical outworking of your life. Which means that you can live in a way that betrays your true identity. Especially if you do not know what that identity is. So, so what we're trying to do is not just head knowledge. We are not just trying to inform your head. We are, no, this is, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord to be able to do some kind of foundational thing that helps you as a person and that helps us as a corporate people to understand the import of the apostolic DNA that runs in our spiritual constitution so that it is not just a word, that is, that is detached from our understanding, even if the word also bears correspondence with our DNA. So you can be something, and you know the name of the thing that you are, but you don't understand what it means. Are you there? All right. So in the, uh, in the book of Matthew, when Jesus was leaving the thing that we call the Great Commission, you remember that Jesus was speaking to his disciples and apostles. The whole idea of apostleship, apostolicity, is basically uh, the notion of being sent. You know that apostolos, to be an apostle just basically means to be someone who is sent. So the word itself is not originally like a, a spiritually loaded word. It's a normal word. The word for messenger of some sort is the word for being sent that is used in everyday language. But like many of the biblical concepts, there's a way that scripture, all right? There's a way that the Holy Spirit takes words that are used in everyday communication and then kind of hijacks it and invests it or enrich, all right, enriches that word with more significance and a robustness that was otherwise absent in the word so that the word now has a meaning, not altogether a new meaning, but an enriched meaning. So it still means what it always meant, but except that now it means more. Hmm? Yeah. So the word will still mean what it always meant, but now it would mean more. That's how most of the concepts we have, redemption, anointing, you know, apostleship, uh, justification, all of those words, basically, are words that were taken from the normal native context, cultural context of the recipient of those uh, uh, epistles. But... There is a thing that God does with these words. And the usage in scripture help you to understand the array, the diversities of implication that the spirit of God is trying to invest that word with now. So, the word to be an apostle it basically means to be someone who is sent ordinarily. That's what it would mean. This is partly uh, one of the reasons why there's so much confusion in different blocks of Christianity, Christian blocks, all right? B-L-O-C, okay? In, there are different, you know, theological blocks or uh, denominational blocks. And the confusion is because of this kind of transition, this kind of enrichment of words that the Bible does. So, when Jesus was teaching in the early days of his ministry in Luke chapter 6, uh, this wasn't part of my script, but I'm sure we can find it. In Luke chapter 6 from about verse 11, let's see what happens there. Luke 6 from about verse 11. Okay, let's go to verse 12. Yes, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Let's read on. 
And when it was day, so Jesus spent all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. Who were these that he called to himself? His disciples. He called his disciples to himself. He called them to himself. Uh, if I had the time, somewhere in the course of the days I'm here, we look at the various stages of calling. All right? There are various stages of calling. The people he calls to himself here were his disciples. And eventually you will still see passage after passage in scripture where Jesus will call to himself his apostles. He called them. He called them. Meanwhile, you would, un, you would imagine that Jesus would just go on and start talking because they were with him. The people he's calling to him are already with him. It, and when it was there, he called his disciples to himself. And from them, this is the new KJV. And from them. Now, this from them means that from the pool of his disciples. He called his disciples to himself. And from them, he chose 12. Whom also he named apostles. So you see that the, the, the apostles were chosen from the pool of disciples that Jesus had after a night of prayer up on the mount. So that before they were apostles, they were disciples. And after they were called apostles, they were still disciples. It is precisely because they were disciples that they could be called apostles. And it is in virtue of their continuing as disciples that they will continue to be apostles. So that uh, discipleship is necessary. Necessary. Even though it is not sufficient, it is necessary for the apostleship. That is to say, you cannot be an apostle if you are not a disciple. And even when you have become, in the manner of speaking, an apostle, you will continue to be a disciple. The apostles, so Jesus actually had, so that we can tease these things out carefully, Jesus, therefore, had more than 12 disciples. It was the disciples he called, and out of the disciples, he chose 12. He called 12 of them. He chose 12 of them, and then he named them apostles. So the apostles were part of the group of the followers of Jesus that were generally called disciples. Jesus had many disciples, and then he now had 12 apostles. In Mark's gospel chapter 3, in Mark chapter 3, the Bible tells us from about verse 11, okay, the, the similar passage to this, the Mark account. The Bible says, unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Okay, let's read on. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Let's read on. And he goeth up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. Let's read on. And he ordained twelve. He ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send. Send. That's the apostleship. That he might send them forth to do what? All right, let's read on. What else were they supposed to do? And to have power... to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. Now, that word, you know, um, when the, the 14th verse, when the Bible says that he might send them forth to preach, the word send there is the word apostolos, all right? It's the same word for the word apostleship. So, you begin to see the genesis of this whole apostleship business in the ministry of Jesus. Beginning from when he was here on the earth. So these were 12 people that Jesus chose and he chose them to be his unique 
emissaries, unique messengers that he sends forth, that he sends forth. Yet, the Bible says in the passage that we are looking at here, that he ordained 12, that they should be with him and that he might send them forth. All right? Um, there is equal weight given in the Greek to being with him and sending them forth. Okay? So, in your KJV, you have that they should be with him and that he might send them forth. In the Greek, is the same word, all right? For sh should and might is the same. The idea basically is sequence, sequence. They should be with him. First, it, it's only in virtual being with him that he can send them forth. That, you know, uh, is straightforward. But I'm dealing with the apostleship with regards to the apostleship. All right, ministry and a conception of how this has evolved over time into the day that we are in now. So, the 12 apostles were chosen out of the many disciples that Jesus had. And even you, you know that. There was the 70. The 70 that Jesus sent out, the 72, they were not 72 apostles. They were his disciples. And when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Paul is giving the statement of the gospel that he preached, he talked about the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to up to about 500 brethren. Those were not apostles, but those were followers of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, there were about 120 disciples in that upper room. So the followers of Jesus were generally called disciples, but among them, there were these 12 that he gave a unique ordination to uniquely represent him as apostles. And the Bible actually says that he called them huh? apostles. He called them apostles. Hallelujah. Okay. When Jesus Christ went to heaven, when he went to heaven, the 12 apostles were now 11 apostles. And it was in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 that we see the replacement protocol for the 12th apostle. That's to replace uh, Judas. And, you know, some people will say Paul was supposed to be the 12th apostle and that kind of thing. Um, Let's learn to be quiet where scriptures are quiet. Hmm? Uh, let's, let's learn to be quiet. The, the, there, is, there are different layers. There are different layers of implication to the activities of God in scripture. So you don't just, you don't just do the mathematics. See, look at how Prominent Apostle Paul became. Shouldn't he have been the 12th Apostle? How many of the 11 were prominent? After Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, how many other apostles were mentioned by name, actually? Apart from Peter, James, John. Like, how many of the 11, the original 11, were even mentioned by name? Acts of the Apostles is not a comprehensive account of everything that all the apostles did. It, it was what the Holy Spirit preserved for us that would be necessary for the ordering of our lives, okay, as followers of Jesus. And there were also historical circumstances that were present in the, uh, uh, I don't use the word evolution, in, in the way that the book Acts of the Apostles came to us. Luke, the writer of that book, was a close associate of Paul. Now, there were other apostles that were in other places doing other things. Like, we're told that Thomas was the apostle to India. But Luke was the writer of this, and was writing his, uh, 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 the record for very specific purposes. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, the reason I wanted us to read that is to begin to get into a little bit of the reason, the reason why these apostles were set in the church, and then to begin to look at the distinctions that we may have in how we understand apostleship. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, uh, about verse 21, right? Okay, and in those days, 
Okay, so maybe we read from verse 15 as you were trying to uh, get us to do. And in those days, Peter, stu Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of them, of the names together were about 120. Okay, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. All right, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out, okay? And this was known unto all dwellers of Jerusalem in so much that the field is called in their proper tongue a caldeman, that is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst or among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. The criteria is very clear here. And if I had the time, I will show you in a few other passages. Pastor, Pastor Grace, you are very welcome. Very, very welcome. All right? In, in, in other passages, maybe I'll probably maybe try and see if I can show you one. The criteria here is the person that will be the replacement for Judas must meet certain conditions. And they said, we need to choose from among us one to replace Judas, and that one must be somebody that had been part of us, beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from among us. The baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from among us. That is the criteria. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, in the house of Cornelius, and I hope I can find it very quickly, just a corroborating passage of scripture. Okay. Um, okay. From verse 36, Acts of the Apostles, Maybe we'll just read from verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth. This is at the house of Cornelius. Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, you know, which was and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. So you see that there is something of a marker about the baptism of John in the definition of the ministry of Jesus. John's baptism. In fact, you know, Jesus himself was the one that said that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent Take it by force. So this, this whole business about John the Baptist is, 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 is well grounded in scripture. And there is a huge, you know, uh, 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 there's a huge theology behind it. And this evening is not the time. The only thing I'm trying to do is to try to put certain things in perspective to help us to understand apostolicity. That the witness in question has to be someone that was part of the story from John the Baptist's baptism up until when Jesus Christ was taken into heaven. It is from that pool that they represent, the replacement for Judas Iscariot must come from. In Acts of the Apostles, when the Bible says with great power in chapter, uh, what? Chapter 4, all right? In chapter 4. When the Bible says in the 40, 
third verse or so, that with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their witnessing was witnessing to the resurrection. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus said to them, you are witnesses of these things. Huh? And you are my witnesses of these things. When Jesus was sending them to go as witnesses, as witnesses, he did say to them that in order for them to witness the things, to witness to the things they had witnessed, in order for them to testify to the things that they had seen, they needed to wait until the Holy Ghost had come upon them. The earliest apostles of Jesus Christ were people that were witnesses both of the life and the times of Jesus as it has to do with his public ministry. So that there was a double sense in which they brought witness. They were eyewitnesses. Are you there? And then they were spirit-empowered witnesses. The reason is because the, the thing that undergirds our faith is not an ideology. It's not a philosophy. Are you there? It's not a mantra. Are you there? The, our faith is not built on a philosophy. It's not built on a mantra. It's not built on an ideology. Christianity is not just an ideology. Christianity is not just a way to looking for God. Christianity is bound up in the person of Christ such that if Christ never came, the thing that is Christianity would never exist. And I don't mean it would have existed by another name. No, it would never have existed. Because Christianity is bound up in the very life of Christ himself. I am the way. Not I know the way. I am the way. Now, so it means that without the way, there will be no way. Jesus didn't just say, I know the way. He didn't just say, I came to a point to the way. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. It's not just by my words. It's not just by my teaching. I am. I am your access to God. That is to say, nobody other than Jesus could have done what Jesus did. And because the Christian faith is not first and foremost an ideology, it's not first and foremost a philosophy, it is the account of a historical reality that the thing upon which our faith rests are things that happened in history. It is therefore, it is therefore easy to see why the Lord will designate that the earliest witnesses of our faith will also be eyewitnesses. They were credible eyewitnesses. They were not just people that were taught beautiful things. You know, Paul summarizes the gospel in Acts of the Apostles chapter 15 from verse 2. The summary of Paul per the gospel is Acts chapter 15. Oh, sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, not Acts. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 2. Paul said, maybe we should read from verse 1. Just, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. The gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. Mm -hmm. By which also you are saved. So it's by this same gospel you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Let's go on. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Are you there? Paul was a recipient. He was a recipient. That which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So there is something that was written in scripture that Jesus will die for our sins. And then there was the reality of it that happened. And Paul is now saying that thing that was written in scripture, it has happened in history. 
And I'm declaring to you the thing that I have received. When you hear the teaching, when you read Paul, you may be tempted here to think that Paul is saying that he received this thing by revelation. No. The things that Paul received by revelation, he will always qualify them. And when you read the context here, that was part of the reason why he went on to list names. To list names of the eyewitnesses of these things about which he was writing, which was the core of the gospel that he preached. That there was cor corroboration, historical corroboration to the biblical statements or the scriptural statement that existed in scripture. So there was something the scripture said. And then there are people that are saying, that thing the scripture say we saw it happened. That is the cornerstone of our gospel, of the, of the, of the gospel. Christianity is not good ideas, it's good news. And, and news, news is not commentary, news. You know, those days, I don't know if they still do it. Radio Nigeria, after the 7 o'clock news, and they, they will now say, for today's commentary, uh, somebody, Ajayi, uh, looks into the state of universal basic health care in Nigeria. They separate the news from the commentary. Because news is an account of something that happened. Huh? Please, be a good boy. That's not news. Do you understand? Be a good boy is not news. That's not news. News is, Tai was slapped at Biola yesterday. That is news. News is bound up in history. It, it, it has to be something that has happened. News is reportage of historical realities. It's not an, it, the gospel is good news. News. What is the news? The news is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Let's go on. And that he was buried. So this was the content of what he received. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh-huh. And that he was seen. Did you see that? He was seen. Of Cephas. Then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren. At once. Of whom the greater part remain. Unto this present. But some are falling asleep. So this is the cradle of Christianity. The fact that. There were almost 500 people as at this time. Paul was writing this epistle in about AD 51. AD 51 is about, you know, it's less than 20 years post the ascension of Jesus. So it's not surprising that some of the people that were witnesses of the resurrected Jesus were still alive. This is probably like what? Like 18 years after Jesus' ascension. So he's saying that majority of these, about 500 people, are still alive. That means there are people you can walk up to and ask them, did you see Jesus? They say, yes, I was there when he came after his resurrection. You know, today people will say, okay, maybe they were hallucinating. It doesn't work. The people are just desperate to look for how to discredit the scriptures. There are no cases known in human history of uniform mass hallucination. <laughs> that is to say, that is, no, let me tell you. When I say uniform, that's the key word. There can be mass hallucination. That means a group of people can hallucinate. But if everybody here is hallucinating, you will be seeing different things. That's how it works. There is no hallucination where a group of people are seeing and hallucinating about the same reality. Even science tells us that it does not make sense. But those are the lengths that people want to go. Because Christianity doesn't just come to tell you good ways, good behaviors. It is bound up in history that a man, somebody lived flesh and blood. And that he was seen by human beings. So there is this category of witnesses that were witnesses that were empowered by the spirit. On top of the fact that they were witnesses that were eyewitnesses of the thing about which they preached. And you know, this is the difference between Christianity and some other ideology. If somebody came and told you something, 
like a philosophy. They can indoctrinate you, you know, so badly, so terribly, that you might be willing to die for that philosophy. But it's a very different matter if it's a historical issue. The difference is this. <laughs> if somebody say, I saw Jesus Christ alive from the dead, it's different from a teaching. If the person didn't see Jesus alive from the dead, there's a level of suffering that when you subject him to, you say, I'll tell you the truth. I didn't actually see him. <laughs> oh, you... <laughs> The fact that the earliest witnesses of Jesus' life and times were willing to die, not for a philosophy. They were willing to die because they said we cannot but say the things which we have seen and we have heard. It's very important that we have that at the foundation of this thing that we have been called to do. People saw it with their eyes. But you know, Paul, Paul came the reverse side of the progression of the life and times of Jesus. Even the progression of the core gospel event. Because that's what he lists here. All right? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. Paul came from the reverse end. So he cries that I may know him and the power of his resurrection the fellowship of his suffering, to be made conformable unto his death. Because he comes from the other side of the cross. The apostles, the other apostles, they saw him, then they saw him die, then they saw him buried, then they saw him raised from the dead. By the time Paul was meeting him, he was meeting the resurrected Jesus. So Paul said the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering, be made conformable unto his death. Paul, even though Paul is an apostle in that sense, in that sense, there is a distinction between Paul and the other apostles. I, I, I need you to get this into your spirit. I need you to get this into your spirit. There was a reason why Paul went to meet the apostles of Jesus in Galatians. Okay? To present to them the gospel that he was preaching so that he will not have run in vain. And he said when they saw it, oh, they said, yeah, fine. They gave him the right hands of fellowship. And now said that he and Barnabas should go unto the Gentiles, then Peter and James and the rest will go to the Jews. Why did he have to do that? Because, partly because, in Matthew chapter 28, the Bible says when Jesus was going to go to heaven, from above verse 18, when Jesus Christ gave, no, from above verse 16, right? In Matthew 28, the command that Jesus gave to his disciples. Then the 11 disciples went away to Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them, okay? And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted, okay? And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Let's go on. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You see, the people Jesus is talking to here were those people that he called unto himself after that night of prayer. And he called them to become apostles. They were the ones. So this thing, in a sense, is an apostolic commission. Because it was the eleven. This was not a general discipleship class that he was talking to here. Okay? This commission, this mandate, primarily on the, in the historical fact, was given out to the apostles. Okay? And he tells them to teach the nations to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So that the teachings of Jesus, the apostolic teaching, was supposed to have its root in the commandments of Jesus. He said it to the apostles to go out there and teach the things that he had commanded them. So the commands of Jesus to these apostles was supposed to form the bedrock of their apostolic ministry to the nations. 
it's therefore not surprising that Apostle Paul will come to meet them to say, look at what I am teaching in the nations. And they said, yes. It comports with the thing that Jesus Christ commanded us to go and teach in the nations. Are you here? It comports with it. That was the earliest check mechanism that Jesus Christ left in the body. Otherwise, anybody can come and say, I heard God. Paul had an encounter on the way to Damascus, isn't it? You were not there. Peter was not there. Anybody can come and say, I heard God, I heard God. As at that time, scripture, the New Testament had not evolved. So there had to be a, a body of witness against which all such claims must be evaluated. And in that context, historical context, the apostolic carcass was that standard, that check mechanism. So however you look at it, these apostles are quite in a different category because of their historical acquaintance with the historical facts about the life of Jesus. And because Christianity is a faith system that is bound up in historicity. The thing is, in fact, in that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think about verse 14, Paul was saying that if Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, our faith is vain. That is to say... <laughs> This thing about the death, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, if it is a lie, there is no Christianity. Our faith will be in vain. So this thing is bound up in the historicity of those gospel facts. What this implies then is the apostles, they form the foundational infrastructure they form the foundational infrastructure for the church at different levels, both in the historical fact and then at the theological level. So that there is a conceptual framework of church life that involves the apostolic ministry or apostolicity in its foundation. Now, this is obviously looking like a class, isn't it? Yes, because that's what it is. You, you, and you need to pay attention. Part of my prayer was that God will give me words. So I want you to try to follow the words that I use. There is apostolicity. All right? There's a historical apostolic context and there's apostolicity as a conceptual framework for how we conceive of what Christianity is. Let me break it down. In the historical situation, the apostles, the 12 apostles of Jesus, those that were witnesses of the life and times of Jesus, they were there to physically transmit the things that Jesus Christ taught to the earliest converts to Christianity. Do you understand that? So that's one level. That's one level. At another level is the fact that the teachings that those apostles taught is a body of apostolic doctrine that is necessary for repeating that same enterprise until Jesus comes the second time. Hmm? Number three, there is, the, there is the authority, there is the authority that Jesus Christ invests with that enterprise of the delivery of the content of the teaching that the apostles used in order to set the earliest converts to Christianity on the path of true spiritual establishment and growth. By that I mean to say, there is, there is an authority that God gave to the apostles so that they'll be able to carry out the apostolic ministry. Do you get it? Then there is the teaching that the apostles taught. Is that okay? And then there's the apostles originally who taught those teachings. So you can see that there are different levels. And all, at all three levels, we are looking at apostolicity. Apostolicity at different levels. So, when the apostles, the original apostles when they are no longer around, the things that they taught is still around. 
when they are no longer around, the God that gave them a, the apostolic authority, that God is still around. So there are different levels of the possibility of apostolicity even till today. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Yes, I know it's a little bit, it's not difficult, it's just boring. But you see, this is, this is how we, this is how we build. I like the KJV of that instruction of Paul to Timothy. See, the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. I like the language of endurance. Endure sound doctrine. It just simply means they will not bear it. But I am saying that I like the KJV word of endure. So we can repurpose it to say that sometimes you may not enjoy doctrine, but you have to endure it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Normally they say that um, healthy food is not sweet food. And sweet food is not healthy food. As you cross the forties, you will prove the truth of that statement. You will realize that many of the things you need, you will need to train yourself to like. <laughs> because you, you probably not like them naturally. Hallelujah. The point will come, you'll be looking for Avocado, you'll be looking for bitter leaf water. <laughs> say, squeeze bitter leaf for me. Say, just squeeze. <laughs> All right? And your children will be looking at you as if you are unevolved. <laughs> and you too, you'll be looking at them. You say, people don't know yet. <laughs> so, so, certain things have to be endured because you just need them. Is that okay? What we are trying to do this evening, you see, by the time some of you, you go to Australia, and you go to Norway, and you go to Canada, and you go to, you don't know the things we are preparing you for now, but you'll find out in the days to come. So stay with me. There are levels of apostolicity that are bound up in of apostolicity that are bound up in this matters. The apostles, therefore, because of the historical progression of the facts, they were the first point of contact. They were the, if you like, they were the human repository, repository of the, of the legacy of Jesus. It was the apostles. They were the ones that he called to be with him. They were the ones that went everywhere he went with him. So they had the opportunity to see the authentication of his teaching by his life. Hallelujah. I was in a teaching that will soon be out. And I was, I was looking at the falsehood of prophets and apostles and all of that. And the difficulty today, when the Bible says, you know, you should beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but then inwardly, they are ravening wolves. And he says you will know them by their fruit. The question is, how are you going to know them today by their fruit? The challenge is many of us are not close enough to see their fruit. Oh, what we think is their fruit is the clothing. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inside, they are wolves. So they will, there are outward appearances from a distance, that will make you think, this is a sheep. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. Some of those people, you will never set eyes on them till you die. And you will think you know the man of God. That you have not even seen him physically in your life. And every time that you watch somebody on the screen, I hope you know that um, it's what they want you to see that you see. Even the way the man seems to love his wife can happen for the screen. You don't know. The woman knows that this is how we are surviving. And the man knows that. This. So everybody has to behave themselves. 
We can go and fight later, but I didn't come into this world to suffer. So anything to secure the food, we'll do that one. Then we can be fighting. So people can be out there in public, say, hey, they are love birds. They are love Oh. <laughs> All of that is sheep's clothing. Is the clothing. Is the clothing. So that they, these earliest apostles, they were the ones that had the opportunity, not just to see, to hear the teachings of Jesus, but to see the hardware, the authentication of that teaching by his life. So if Jesus taught humility, they know whether it was true in his life or not. You know, there's humility for the screen. Oh, you don't know there's humility for the camera? Hey. There's humility for the camera. This thing, people, people take long periods of time to train in the art of public presentation. They will do all the right things. They will say all the right things. They, will, they, they know how to strike all the right emotional curves in the human psyche and create an image that is completely detached from the realities of their life. And because you only see them on the screen, you think that what you see is what it is. Hey Amen. That guy is humble. You, you don't know. You don't know. So me, I used to tell people that if you don't know enough, don't stand with me. Any day that somebody comes and hey, Gideon did it. Don't say we stand with Gideon. If you are not on... <laughs> If you are not on talking terms with Gideon, eh? don't stand with Gideon. You can just choose to not join the people that are fighting. Just say you don't know enough to know. Because you don't. And the Bible says to not be partaker in other men's sins. Some of you are collecting koboko because you were on Facebook standing with a man that God was fighting. I have gone to become a partaker in another man's sin. Say, Papa, we stand with you, we stand with you. He, he? <laughs> what do you know? You know that video they, they posted yesterday. I was saying in that video that some of, some of the people that do know that we stand with you, we stand with you. It is your first fruit that they are using to service their child's side cheeks. That first fruit that you brought us unto the Lord. Oh, <laughs> some of the people you are standing with, they are family that you know. Is a man, his wife, and three beautiful children. You don't know the other seven. <laughs> you see, you are laughing because you don't know. You don't know the other seven. Those other seven are the ones that are alive. Yes, some of it was still, it was still your tight that they used to sponsor abortion. Oh. Oh. You know, by, by virtue of what we do, there are things we hear. Huh? Some, sometimes there are, there are WhatsApp messages that we read. So don't be in a hurry to stand with, stand with, stand with. You, and, and voice notes that we hear. Because even the victims, we know that you will have a hard time believing what they are trying to say to you. But you saw, you saw those 12 guys. If Jesus said anything in public, they knew the truth in private. This was why they were willing to die for it. He... Such a man. When they walked with him, they had the opportunity to see the corroboration in life of the things that he said in words. And we know that it went deep enough because those men were willing rather to die 
than to change their statement. That was the level of impression that it made on them. It's like, how can, how can you tell me I didn't see what I saw? Do you understand? They were eyewitnesses of that fact. And because of that, because of that, there was a, there was a place that they, there is a place that they occupy that nobody else will occupy. That's why they are called the apostles of the Lamb. They were the foundation historically, and then they formed the foundation doctrinally and theologically of the edifice that is called the church, the ecclesia that Jesus Christ builds. So even in the historical situation, uh, you know the passage in Ephesians chapter 2, isn't it? Ephesians 2.20, the Bible talks about the fact that, Ephesians 2.20, all right, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You are built upon the apostles, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the apostolic ministry is a foundational ministry. Because it was to that ministry that Jesus Christ committed the original ancient totems of our faith. Everything rises and falls insofar as he stands upon that foundation. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. That means, I mean, he is the one that upholds everything. And so, the ministry of the apostle and the apostolic ministry, two things. Please follow my words. The ministry of the apostle and the apostolic ministry are foundational. That's my first point of the evening. Point one. <laughs> the ministry of the apostle and the apostolic ministry are foundational. I said everything I said so that I can say this one. First point. They are foundational. You have seen, number one, in, sec, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, right? That would be the passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul speaking from above verse 9, from above verse 8. Let's see. All right? Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Okay? We are laborers, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. That means you are God's farm. You are God's building. Okay? Let's go on. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And I've been needing to teach this recently because there's been all kinds of distortions and misunderstanding. Apostle Paul, the great apostle himself, he said that as a wise or competent master builder, master builder, he said, I have laid the foundation. With all of that qualification, I thought he would say, I have built, but he said, I have laid. I said, you call yourself a wise master builder, not just a builder. Not just a master builder, a wise master builder. And what you did was laying, not building. As a wise master builder, I have laid what? The foundation. And he says, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay. Than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation is Jesus Christ. What Paul therefore is saying is that what I have done, what I did as a wise master builder, the apostolic grace upon my life was such that I have laid the foundation. And the foundation, so you are not confused, is Jesus Christ. I said to you that the ministry of the apostle and the apostolic ministry is what? Foundational. Foundational. So you see this popular notion of apostle of uh, gyration, apostle of, you know, relationship. Uh, 
you know, apostle of money, apostle of teleporting, apostle of. Hello? If God called you, if God called you to teach people how to teleport, you are not an apostle. I'm not even saying that you were not called to teach people how to teleport, even though I'm saying it. But if, if that was your calling, if that was your calling, you are not an apostle. The ministry of the apostle and the apostolic ministry are foundational. So it does not, it does not delegitimize other expressions. There is he that builds on it. No problem. But we are simply saying that we must identify the apostolic DNA first. And that is foundational. When you lay the foundation, you can determine whether you want to use glass to do the superstructure, or you can determine to use whether you want to use mahogany, all right? Very beautiful wooden uh, superstructure, or you can decide if you, it is brick and mortar you want to use. You can decide if it is stone you want to use to do the superstructure. You can, there's a lot of creativity that can be brought in at the superstructure level. But foundation is sacrosanct. And we are saying that the ministry of the apostle and the apostolic ministry is foundational or are foundational. That is to say, if you are, if you are truly apostolic, you will excel in the foundationals. That is the DNA. That's the DNA of the team. Are you with me? That is the foundation. That is the basis. And this is the burden of the apostolic. Foundations. Foundation. And the foundation which we will deal with tomorrow is, according to Paul, is Christ Jesus. So when he said, as a wise master builder, according to the grace of God that is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. He identifies what foundation is. For no other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So when he says, I have laid the foundation, what is he saying he laid? Jesus Christ. The message, the thrust, the burden, the focus, the priority, huh? the, the deciding, the big thing about the apostolic is Jesus Christ. It, they, the, the, his merchandise is Jesus Christ. The thing when in Caricom market can sell, now Jesus. That's what I'm saying. And you will need to, we will not need to tease out what is the implication of laying Jesus as foundation. If you were called to teach people how to make money, huh? so that they can sponsor their vanity or sponsor the gospel. No problem. We are simply saying that that is not foundation. Are you there? That, that is not the DNA of the apostolic. There is one body, there is one overarching, all-consuming passion of the apostolic. And I'm using it in the, in the generic sense now. Whether it is the ministry of the apostle or the apostolic ministry, the apostolicity. Apostolicity takes its root from the origin of the word apostle. It was Jesus that sent them. They are emissaries of Jesus. They are extension, as it were, of Jesus Christ. You shall be witnesses unto me. Unto me. Part of the implication of that is that the outcome of your witnessing is that I will emerge. You will be witnesses. And then you say, to what end? Unto Jesus. When you bear witness, what will happen is that Jesus Christ will appear. That was why Paul was telling the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, you remember Paul saying to them, Oh foolish Galatians, give it to me before we pray. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Was Jesus killed in Galatia? How is it that Paul, long after Jesus is dead, is saying that Jesus Christ, before the eyes of the Galatians, was evidently set forth, 
crucified among them. Because that is the burden of the apostolic ministry. And time is come to reclaim the original DNA of this faith that was handed over to us by the original apostles. We do not call ourselves apostles or apostolic just because it is a fad. No! That's the original emphasis, the foundation block of everything that we stand, the test, the true test of spirituality. This was why in the earliest days when a church people, when a city receives the gospel, they will send a, ba a batch, a batch, a contingent of apostles to that place. The idea was to establish them because the apostle uniquely and apostolicity is the burden by which God does what? He realizes Jesus Christ in the vessels of men. My little children, of whom I travel again as in birth, until Christ is formed in you. That's the burden of the apostolic. I want to see you. I want to see your face. And I want to know your way. And I want to touch. So I can live your day. I want to see you. Don't worry. Don't worry. You can bow to your head. And I want you to talk to Jesus this evening. It was the first evening and we were trying to gather firewood for the bonfire that the Spirit of God intends to intense. You know, you, 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 we leave this place with such a passion for the true apostolic faith. That when we say we are an apostolic people, it will no longer just be by word of mouth. It will not be a cliche. It won't just be a fad. It will not be something we say in order to gather cloud. And it will not just be the way we differentiate ourselves from other blocks in the Christian faith. It will be that truly, truly, we are returned to the original ancient DNA of this faith on account of which some people died and they even died upside down. Men were born at the stake in order to preserve this faith. Jesus it is. At the foundation of this matter. And you want to say again today. That God will re-engineer you. You know some of us gradually there is a departure. A deterioration. Maybe on account of the pressure of life. Maybe on account of the bling blings. Maybe on account of peers. Maybe on account of family demands. And gradually you are being tempted to compromise on the foundation. Which is Christ Jesus himself. And tonight... You want to say, Jesus, Jesus, oh, push me again. Realign me to true apostolicity. Let the DNA, let the DNA, let the DNA that is apostolic, let it not only reside, let it be evident. Are you talking to Jesus tonight? We came to class. But I'm sure you are taking something away. Apostle is not what we call somebody that has become popular. No. No. Meleno Sema. Bring us back to the days. The days. Of true apostolicity in word, in deed, and in our corporate essence. Bring us back to those days.